Catholic social teaching or social justice teaching, which is kind of the substance of this course, had its modern beginnings in <clears throat> the Industrial Revolution, 17 and 1800s, and the massive economic and social changes that took place at that time. So that's why we're focusing in on that time period. So we'll talk a little bit about what the Industrial Revolution was. This is something you are probably already familiar with, and I'd like to tap into your brains as well if, if, you, if you think I've missed something important about the Industrial Revolution, talk about what you already know. And then we'll see how people responded to that situation. One response was from the philosopher Karl Marx. Other responses were from people of faith. At the end of it, you'll have a journal entry that will essentially ask you to summarize in a paragraph what you've learned. But then I'd like us to discuss the question, what were the positives and negatives of the Industrial Revolution? Did the positives outweigh the negatives for us today? And where are we headed? going into the future. When you have your written final exam, which will just be like a blackboard quiz type thing, this will be on it. So this is like the need to know stuff you need to walk away from the course with. If you forget everything else we learned, <laughs> remember Pope Leo and the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so let's talk about what the Industrial Revolution was. It's a blanket term that's used to describe these massive changes that happened in the 1700s and 1800s, mostly in Europe, Western Europe and Great Britain, to some degree in North America. I think things kind of started off in Great Britain, spread to Western Europe, spread to North America. And in a way, the changes that the West went through 200 years ago, other countries are now going through, Asia, Latin America, Africa, they're kind of going through their own sort of industrial revolution now and encountering some of the same, some of the same challenges that the West faced two centuries ago. Three centuries, really. Okay, so we could summarize the industrial revolution by saying that it was the introduction of power-driven machinery and factory organization into the, the economy. So it started with technological changes. So by power-driven machinery, machinery, I mean that people used primarily steam created by burning coal to drive machines that were able to produce consumer goods, goods. So we were able to make more stuff on a massive scale using machinery. It's what we're familiar with today. When we think of industry, when we look across the street and look at BP, that's what happened. That all happened during the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so we started using machinery instead of making things by hand. And we went from the cottage industry, where essentially individuals made things in their homes or villages, to factories, where workers were all brought together into one place. You've probably heard of the development of the assembly line with Gerald Ford and auto manufacturing. In the past, most workers would see the making of a product kind of from its beginnings to its end. You might have a person who, who raised sheep and sheared off their wool. Somebody else might spin the wool into yarn. That same person would probably weave the yarn into cloth. They might send the cloth off to somebody else to make clothing out of it. But that, a lot of the production would kind of be centered within homes and villages. Now, instead of people doing things independently in their homes, everybody would be brought to a factory, and each worker would just do one small piece of that, that process. So you'd have these massive machines to spin wool into, into um, thread and make thread into cloth. That's what you see the little boy doing on that machine. Those are bobbins. The bobbins are these spools that have the thread wound around them, and the machines pull the, spools, pull the thread off the spools and rapidly weave it into cloth. So I'm hoping that we'll have a hand weaver here during Humanities Week for you to actually see how hand weaving used to be done. Imagine taking that process, putting it into a machine on just a massive scale. And ch children in the workforce were a huge, they were a huge part of the labor force in Great Britain, I think in the 1700s and 1800s. In a home setting or a farm setting, it's natural and normal for children to work. Children help out on a family farm with the chores. And it's not dangerous. In fact, it's good for kids to learn to work at a young age. 
When people moved to the cities and got jobs in factories, they naturally brought their kids along with them to help out. So kids ended up entering the workforce at great personal health risks. They would lose fingers and arms in machines. They'd be sent down into coal mines to crawl along in narrow passages that adults couldn't get into. And they'd get breathing problems or even die. So children were, were drawn into the workforce but in a situation that became very dangerous to them. And at this time, there were no labor laws or safety laws. There, it didn't even occur to people that there needed to be laws. Why, why should there be? People were used to deciding what to do with their families and their businesses. So it never occurred to anybody that factories needed to have laws that would tell them what to do. And, and, if, and there were no laws about wages. Factory owners could pay whatever they wanted. And that made perfect sense. Hi, David. And that made perfect sense. Why should the government tell a business owner how much he or, he or she should pay their workers? So there were no labor laws to dictate what wages should be, dictate how many hours people should work, people working massively long hours, or dictate how old you had to be to get a job. Karl Marx, whom I'll talk about in just a few minutes, in his book Capital, catalogs many of the stories of workers and the things that they were suffering. And there, there's a story about one woman who was working in a dressmaking shop making clothes for wealthy ladies in Great Britain and London. She literally died on the job. They would work her almost around the clock and give her a little bit of wine or a little bit of coffee to keep her going for like 30 hours. And she'd get a few hours of sleep, get up and do it again. So people were working massive hours, and there were no limits on it. So this was a situation when people went from making things at home by hand to making things in a factory using power-driven machinery. And these, these are changes that we're all familiar with. But what's important to realize is that during the Industrial Revolution, these changes were new, and there was no system or laws or even ethics in place to kind of protect workers. People moved on a, a grand scale from the country into the city, so from rural life to urban life, urbanization. This phenomenon is now happening in developing countries. Asia, Africa, Latin America, massive movements of people from villages and farms into cities looking for work. And consequently, when you have a labor surplus, when you have more than enough workers for the jobs, what happens? Sadie, let's say you're a business owner and you have 10 positions to fill, and you've got 100 people lining up for those positions, what does that enable you to do? Does it matter if one of them gets hurt? No. no. Take another one. Take another one. <laughs> Go, buy, see ya, and hire somebody else. You can pay whatever you want, because they're all so desperate for jobs, they'll take anything. So low wages, no worker protections, the advantage was really with the business owners in that, in that respect. Okay. We also saw in really the 1400s the, the rise of capitalism. Put this in your notes. I don't think I put it on the slide. But capitalism, strictly speaking, is an economy based on lending. Lending being the key word there. Capitalism typically includes the concept of free market, meaning businesses essentially get to do whatever they want. But lending is really the crux of it. In a way, lending creates a level playing field. Santiago, let's say you want to start a business making tennis rackets. You need materials, you need workers, you probably need some machinery. Do you have the money for that right now? No. Of course not. So you go to the bank, give them a proposal, and you borrow $50,000 or whatever you need to get the business started. Lending allows us to do that. But the bank is going to want that money back, right? What do you have to do when you pay back a loan? What do you have to add on to it? Interest. interest. So lending means interest. And that's how banks make money. That's how people, wealthy people who have money to lend make money by doing that. They lend it out, ask for 3%, 5% interest rate, whatever. They get that money back with the interest. So it's good for everybody. Santiago gets to start his business, the bank makes money, everybody's happy. So capitalism has some very positive things about it. It can also have some negative impacts, too. Okay, it, it tends to concentrate wealth and power in the hands of a few. 
and it tends, it drives an economy that's bent on expanding. That's great when you have a whole world with new frontiers to expand into and lots of resources. That's not so great now, as we'll find out when we watch the story of stuff video I'm going to show you guys maybe next week. We're running out of resources, but we've got this economy that's based on constant expansion. One key economic indicator today is the rate of new housing starts. Do you know what a new housing start is? Building new homes. So people think that in order for our economy to be healthy, we have to be constantly building new homes. And not only new homes, but even more new homes every year. Economists want to see the rate of housing starts rise every year. That means they want to see us building new homes on farmland and wild land every year. Well, guess what? We have a limited amount of space. We can't do that forever. So a capitalistic economy, an economy based on lending, is also an economy based on constant expansion. Businesses have to be making more profits every year. Lenders and investors want to see those profits go up. That means they're going to squeeze their workers even harder every year. They're going to use more resources every year. So capitalism has great benefits, but it also has some drawbacks. And as we saw when our economy crashed in 2008, capitalism also opens the way for risky practices. What happens when banks lend money and people can't pay it back? The whole house of cards collapses. Okay. Wages were considered free agreements. As I pointed out before, back in the Industrial Revolution, a business owner could pay whatever they wanted, and the workers pretty much had to accept that. And the idea was that, let's say, I, David, David's hiring. So I go to him and I apply for a job, and he says, okay, I'm going to pay you $5 an hour. I agree to that. That's considered a contract between us. I've agreed to it, and therefore that's fair. It's fair because I agreed to accept that wage. Now maybe I can't really make ends meet on that amount of money. But that according to this kind of thinking, that doesn't make it unfair. So there was no concept that wages, that there was anything unfair about paying people very little money. So the result was, of course, and we know this, poverty and suffering for just massive amounts of people. Power and wealth tending to be concentrated in the hands of a few. The next point is important when we think about what social justice is. These challenges were systemic. They were not just the product of one or two people's decisions. When, when we think about morality at the level of our own personal lives, we tend to think about things like following the Ten Commandments. Don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat on your spouse, don't harm other people. At the level of the individual and our individual choices, that's fine. But at the level of a problem, like, like what was created during the Industrial Revolution, it's not enough. It's not enough for me to just be a morally good person. There's massive amounts of suffering going on. My being a good person isn't going to change that. Factory owners, for example, would go to church every Sunday and sit there in the pew and listen to the sermon. And maybe they, as individuals, were good people. But what were they doing to others? So the problems were systemic. They were the results of a system or a structure, economic, technological, and social structure that was not the responsibility of any one person and couldn't be changed by the decisions of any one person. And this is very important to realize because we are surrounded by structures. Education is a structure. We're pipelined into it at a very young age, kindergarten, preschool, whatever. We continue that through high school. We're expected to then maybe be able to get a job. The, jobs, the job market itself is a structure that we human beings have created that sometimes helps people and sometimes harms them. So we're always part of these structures. And sometimes we're so much a part of them that we're not even aware of them. But it's the way society as a whole works. And part of social justice is becoming aware of that. What are the structures that encompass our lives are they just or unjust? How do they affect people? One person who responded to the situation, along with others, but he was a key figure, was the philosopher Karl Marx. He, he was one of the first people to open his eyes and look around and really see what, was, what the impacts of the Industrial Revolution on human beings were and to critique it, to critique it. So he lived, I think, in the mid-1800s. 
His most famous book, his capital, which wasn't, I don't think, published until after his death, and it was a critique of capitalism. The very essence of the way capitalism works, he critiques it. He and one of his colleagues, Friedrich Engels, I believe he was British, also co-authored the famous Communist Manifesto, a statement of the essential tenets that became communism in later decades. And the, the basic message that they had was the workers should control the means of production. In other words, why does one wealthy person own the factory? Why shouldn't the workers own it? And they were sending out a call to the workers to rise up and unite and take over the means of production. They really wanted a revolution. Their work helped to inspire the process of developing labor unions throughout the 1800s. Karl Marx advocated violent class struggle and revolution. And he rejected religion. He was, he was an atheist, not because he didn't think that God was a good idea, but because he thought that religion had a way of making people apathetic about what was going on around them. He was directing his criticisms mainly at Christianity, not other global religions. But his point was, Christians are so fixated on this thing of getting to heaven after they die, that they don't care about what's happening in this life. They don't care about what's happening in this world, and that's bad. So he's famous for the quote, religion is the opium of the people. What is opium? And what does it, what does it do to you? I think, doesn't it kind of just make you lie there and do nothing? <laughs> people who are really hooked on opium, it's a downer, I think. They just lie there on a couch and do nothing. And he was saying, basically, religion is a drug that makes people just ignore what's really going on in the world. His philosophy attracted many workers. Workers were increasingly drawn to his way of thinking, and therefore, of course, drawn away from the church, which, from the point of view of the church, was a problem. So it was really Karl Marx and his his response that made Christians start to sit up and think about what was going on in the 1800s. This is the origin of what we've been calling the learn, reflect, act method. The first step in social justice is just to open your eyes and see what's going on around you. Back in the 1800s, I think Christians were sort of opiated by the idea of heaven and the illusion that they were leading good lives. I think today, this is just my personal opinion, people are opiated by entertainment. What do we typically see when we look at the media? Celebrities and gossip. We don't see what's going on in the Crimea. We don't see human trafficking. We don't see the pollution in, in Lake Michigan unless for once the paper puts it on the front page. We don't see that. We see all this, excuse my language, crap that doesn't mean anything. So I think today there are opiates around, but it's not religion. So the first challenge is just to open our eyes and really look at what's going on around us. Reflecting means looking to our core teachings. We talked a little bit about the Bible when we did the Good Samaritan story. For Christians, those core teachings are the Bible. For others, it may come from their families or from personal experience. But what are your values? And then act, obviously, is doing something about it. Karl Marx did that by inspiring labor unions to begin to organize. One of the first people to respond to learn, reflect, and act from a Christian situation was Father Wilhelm Kettler, a German priest who, when he moved to Berlin, saw the poverty and violence that was going on and started to respond to it first in speaking. He spoke out about the suffering of workers. Back then, being a priest and being able to give a sermon or a speech at Sunday worship was a very powerful position. Everybody would be in that church on Sunday because most people were some form of Christian in Germany in the 1800s. So they'd be in church. They'd be listening to whatever that priest had to say when all of a sudden this man decides to speak up about the injustices going on around them. It caused quite a stir. Some of the people in the pews were probably the factory owners who contributed a lot to the parish. So he was a very courageous person just to speak out. 
His most famous, I guess for I guess well known, series of speeches were a series of sermons he gave during Advent. Advent is the season leading up to Christmas. I guess a lot of people would have been in church around Christmas. So he gave these sermons during Advent, which attacked the injustices of the Industrial Revolution in 1848. He became a bishop in 1850, so people did recognize his contributions. He and others like him, Catholics, leaders, intellectuals, started to reflect and talk more and more about the problems that were going on. And one of the conclusions that they drew, and put this in your notes because I didn't put it in the slide, is the idea of charity is not enough. So this is the start, really, of modern Catholic social teaching. Yeah, it's been around since Jesus and the prophets, but this was modern social justice from a faith perspective. A Catholic leader who brought things to a head was Pope Leo XIII, and he's the person that I'd ask you to kind of walk away from the course just remembering and knowing about. Uh, when you're on your final exam, I will ask you about, about him and what he accomplished. He was born to an upper-class Italian family, entered the priesthood, and eventually became the Pope. The Pope is the leader of the global Catholic Church. There have been good popes, and there have been bad popes, and Catholics should know that. He was one of the better ones. But as a priest and a bishop, he did a lot of charity work, as well as some social justice work. He created homes for homeless boys and girls, and for elderly women. He set up soup kitchens, and this is the product of research by a student of mine a couple years ago. I didn't know this much about him. He also opened a bank in Italy, Monte di Pietà, which focused on low-income people and low-interest or no-interest loans. So let's say you want to start your business making tennis rackets. You go to a bank, they're going to charge you a lot of interest. You then have to struggle to pay that back. You go to Monte di Pietà, and they will give you that $50,000. They just want you to pay it back. They don't want to make money off of it. So low interest or no interest loans is one way of addressing social injustices. Today, an organization called Catholic Relief Services is doing this in over 92 countries around the world. They're helping people start their own small businesses with low interest or no interest loans. And with a... Uh, you know, of course, when you don't pay your loan back, you get in trouble with the bank. They'll take your house or your car, or they'll take your business assets or whatever, and you go into bankruptcy. People who are trying to help the poor will be a little bit more compassionate and lenient about, okay, you can have a little extra time to pay this back as long as you get the money to a Sunday. Also, as a priest and bishop, when there were natural disasters, he would donate the church's resources to helping the victims rather than to Catholic rituals or religious, specifically religious things. I've done my, uh, my news story for the week already. It was interesting. I'll show you the slide later. But there was a headline yesterday on Yahoo that Pope Francis has permanently removed a bishop in Germany who spent like $43 million on the bishop's residence. He's been termed the blame bishop because he spent so much money on something. It wasn't his private home, but it was like church property. And Pope Francis is all about the poor and helping the poor. I think Pope Leo, hopefully, would have been kind of the same way. Look, don't spend all this money on buildings. Spend it on helping people. So that was more Pope Leo's attitude. 
So his big thing was not just the stuff he did, but a document that he wrote. Writing can be powerful. We know that from the media today. Back then, we didn't have the internet, but we did have the printing press, and the church, with its global organization, has the capacity to circulate things widely, more so than any other organization did at the time. So he wrote this thing called an encyclical. It's a letter written by a pope that is considered very authoritative in the church. Usually it's addressed to leaders like priests and bishops, but they're expected to communicate it to everybody. So in theory, a message can go out from the pope, go to bishops, go to priests, and from the priests to all the people. And that was pretty much his intention. So it's a letter written by a pope addressed to all the bishops and other leaders of the whole Catholic Church, considered to have a high degree of authority. Not as much as the Bible, of course. But still, it's something very important that people are supposed to take seriously. So he wrote this encyclical, Pope Leo XIII, called Rerum Novarum. Those are Latin words that mean about new things. He was recognizing we've got a new situation here. We have to take a look at it and see what's happening. Think seriously about it and take action. So he observed the big challenges of the Industrial Revolution and Communism. He reflected on those challenges in light of values from Christian faith. And he urged Christians to take action. Some of the reflect values that were key that he put in this letter were these notions, the living wage, limited government regulation of business, support for labor unions, and having a social conscience. These were new ideas at the time. Grounded in the Bible and Christian faith, but at the time something new. Oh, what is a living wage? Have you heard that term before? What do we call it today? Yeah, we call it minimum wage. So the Pope put out this radical idea that workers ought to be paid enough to be able to support a family. Business owners were like, what? Who ever heard that? But it was a new idea at the time. We take it for granted today, but we have it because of this man who introduced this idea in an authoritative and powerful way. That idea eventually, after like four decades, made its way into law. And we have it, at least in, in some countries. His encyclical, by the way, was published, I believe, in 1891. So remember that date. How silly, I didn't put that in here. But what Rerum Novarum was written in 1891. Yes, yeah, so we'll put that down, too. We'll put it on the board. Hopefully I'll spell it correctly. So this is the landmark date that we look to when we think about the beginnings of modern Catholic social teaching. So he put that idea of a living wage in there. He put the idea of government regulation of businesses. In other words, if a business is not treating its workers fairly or protecting their health and safety, it's okay for the government to step in and make laws about that. Again, this was a new idea. And business owners were like, what? The government tell us what to do? That's still the Republicans today, right? Republicans want government to get its nose out of business and let businesses do whatever. That's why the state of Indiana is consistently ranked very high among states that are good for business because we don't regulate that much. Businesses are kind of allowed to do a little bit more of whatever they want, like not having labor unions, not protecting the environment, stuff like that. Okay, But back then it was way, way worse. So, and he, he stressed that that regulation ought to be very limited. The government should not take over business. That's communism. It should be very, very limited. He also supported labor unions, which at the time, again, were radical. People organizing to demand change. Workers going on strike, for example. And he said that people need to have a social conscience. That means it's not enough for me to be a good person in my individual life. I have to pay attention to what's going on in the world and take responsibility for it. If, if there are poor people on the streets, I, I really need to worry about that and be concerned. If, if the state is passing laws that are 
a violation of people's rights, then I have to get involved and, and try in a democracy to advocate for fairer laws. So we have to have a social conscience. We have to pay attention and get involved. And some of this was based in the Bible. Here's a quote in the green box from the letter itself, Rerum Novarum. There, and here he's addressing the notion of the living wage. There underlies a dictate of natural justice. So he's appealing to the idea that there's a law in the universe more basic than human law, more imperious and ancient than any bargain between man and man. So people make deals and bargains and agreements with each other, but there are some laws that are more basic. Namely, that wages ought not to be insufficient to support a frugal and well-behaved wage earner. So your salary should be enough to support you and your family living simply, not buying five TVs or going to the casino every weekend, but putting food on the table and having a nice, modest house and sending your kids to a decent school. You ought to get paid enough to be able to do those things. Again, it was a new idea that the natural law is more important than human law and that it tells us what to do. And then there's this quote from the book of Genesis in the Bible that sees work as a gift from God the dignity of work and of workers was also a key idea for Pope Leo. I didn't put that in the slide, but it's really important. Maybe just put the word dignity. It led to the idea, the whole idea that people, not just as workers, but as people, have dignity and are worthy of respect. So he was turning back to this quote to show that work is a gift from God. It's something God gave us to do. Work should be treated with dignity, not bought and sold like a commodity. People shouldn't be enslaved for their work. But it led to this idea, which is really basic to Catholic social teaching today, that the human person, as such, has dignity and is worthy of respect. Some of the impacts of Ray Room Memorial, just some. It changed the attitude of the church. Catholicism in general, maybe religion in general, tends to be conservative. Religious people tend to not like change, so we become defensive and we judge change as bad. But Pope Leo's letter helped the Catholic Church to be a little bit less defensive toward the changes going on in the modern world, and really to take an interest and be a little bit more open-minded. So the church became less defensive toward modern politics and economics. The letter helped to legitimate labor unions Instead of unions being considered as communist and therefore bad, the Pope's approval opened the way for more people to join and to support labor union, unions and ultimately help to strengthen them. The notion of the living wage made its way into law as an example. This happened in 1938 in the United States with the Fair Labor Standards Act, which introduced the minimum wage, I forget what it was, it was very low by today's standards, and introduced some limitations on working hours, the 40-hour work week. So those things made their way into law in the US in 1938. So that's one example to keep in mind. Kind of pin your hat on that date, too. It was when we first did worker protections here in the United States. And it's really rather recent if you think about it. And again, he started the tradition of modern Catholic social justice teaching. Ever since then, the church at all levels, has continued to reflect on the things that are going on in society. One of my favorite websites is the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, usccb.org. If you have a question about anything social justice related, you can go to their search engine, put in the topic, and you'll almost always find that the church has something to say about it. Whether it's poverty, nuclear weapons, clergy sex abuse, which is something the church had to address, and almost anything you can think of, immigration, the Catholic Church in the U.S. is big on that issue. Even tattoos. I had a, a student who had a question about tattoos about a year ago. And I was like, well, let's go to the USCCB. They wanted to know what the church taught because they assumed that Catholics taught that getting a tattoo was a sin. So I said, well, let's see. We put tattoo in the USCCB search engine and we found something about it. So the church today is responding to almost everything that's going on in a very informed and very careful and thoughtful way. So the USCCB website is a great source. So we still do this. This wasn't something that happened just once and we forgot about it. Okay. 
I'm going to give you a journal entry, and then I will take a break, and then I'd like to, in the time we have left, have a little bit of conversation about it. So in your journal, focus on writing a cogent paragraph with a single man in a sentence, and then three details and some sort of conclusion. Summarize the impacts of the Industrial Revolution in your own words, and how people of faith responded to that, how Catholic social teaching responded. In a single cogent paragraph, doesn't have to be long, but it should be substantive. Then take a break and we'll discuss. I want to hear what you think are the positives and negatives of the Industrial Revolution. So do that in your journals right now.